uh, really reflect uh, some of the key themes that I want to explore today as we look at the Easter story. Words like freedom, weaknesses, came through as we were singing uh, this morning. It's not, not just about, I mean, they were great songs, How Deep the Father's Love, just reminds us of what he did on the cross. But there's something in those words, freedom, weaknesses, that kept coming through in the songs, that as we look at some characters today in the story, in the account that the Bible gives us, should inspire us and should help us to understand that actually we have a place and a part in all this too, in spite of all our weaknesses. And Mandy talked about the struggles that people are going through at the minute. Yeah, you know what? We're all going through struggles. For some of us, that's meant death and the loss of a real loved one. But again, the Easter story should inspire us and ignite something in us because what a group of people went through more than this group of people that we're going to look at today. That on Friday, they saw their best friend for years crucified on the cross. And then they could do nothing because of the Sabbath law except reflect on what they had seen. And then, as we shall see today, those same people, in all their weaknesses, but with a real heart and love for Jesus, discovered something that was so exciting, it has changed the world. It's an amazing story, and those songs were fantastic. And hopefully as we look through this account today, you'll see how those songs really just fit in with what we're looking at today. But I want to ask you a question first. In fact, I want to ask you two questions. Do you know how Easter is set? Now, I asked this to my mum last night, and of course, your mum always knows the answer to everything. Well, she got it completely wrong. I was quite amazed, actually. Christmas is set on one day, but Easter is, or you've heard it said, oh, Easter's early this year, Easter's late this year. Why does the, the date change for Easter Sunday so much? Well, here you are. Here's the explanation. Come on. Do you know? Do you know, Elijah? It's a bit wordy, so I'm, I had to write it down. This is how Easter is set, Okay. Easter Sunday always falls on the Sunday after the first full moon following the spring equinox in March. So last night was the full moon, okay? Which, uh, if you know your moons, they all have a name. It was called the pink moon. Not because of its color, but they're named after a flower. So last night was the full moon. And so today is the first Sunday after that full, uh, first full moon. So today is Easter Sunday. Now, it can be, Easter Sunday can be as early as March the 22nd. And its latest date is April the 25th. So, it just seems a bit odd to me. You know, why don't they just make it one date like Christmas and then it would be so much easier. But it's all to do with the moon which links me nicely to my next question, which is this. If you could go back in time to one historical event, what would you like to witness? Let me ask you that again. What comes to mind? If you were to go back in time to one historical event, what would you like to witness? As I thought about that question, two things came to my mind. I'm a, a 70s child, born in 71. So two events in the 60s came to mind. The first was in 1966. So the World Cup final. I think it would have been amazing to have been there. I had a look. It, it says the attendance was 96,924. 
the reason I thought of that one, it just would have been amazing to be part of that crowd, to celebrate just the joy of the fact that England were at that time the best team in the world. And just the celebration would have been amazing, I think. And just to have experienced that joy, that jubilation, that, that just utter euphoria, just that it would have been an amazing place to be. So that's one. The other one I'd have, I thought of, which links to the moon, was a few years later. Uh, 1969, and I'd have loved to have been at the launch of the Apollo 11. Now, I've actually seen, I, I don't go abroad very much, don't get away, but my dad did take me to um, Florida quite a few years ago, and I had the chance to see the Saturn rocket. Well, you can be walking down this thing for ages, and you're still not... <laughs> You're still only halfway. This thing was enormous, just full of fuel to take them up into space. It's just amazing. But the thing I'd have loved would be to have heard that noise of that thrust, of that power, of that rocket just propelling those three men up into space. I just think that would have been amazing to have been around just to see that thing take it. And, of course, for them, we know what happened but for, for the people watching that takeoff, there was no knowing that it was going to get off the launch pad. So there must have been that sense of, of nervousness, of fear. But wow, what a place to have been in time, to have heard that uh, just take off and erupt. But a few days later, that, the launch was uh, 16th of July, 1969. On the 20th of July, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, they uh, left uh, the capsule in space and landed on the moon. And what strikes me, if ever you've watched some of these space films, is the quietness of space. So there's all that noise of the takeoff. And then a few days later, it said, uh, the records say that 650 million people watched Neil Armstrong step, take that first step onto the moon. 650 million people watched that event across the world. And yet, it, it must have been so strange for these two men, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, because they were so many thousands of miles away from Earth, and in that total, almost total silence, they took that step onto the moon. It says in John chapter 20, verse 1, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Very early on that first day of the week. Now, some people are morning people. Some people are night people. But that word early, that word early, it was a technical word for the last of the four watchers into which the night was divided. So the time that Mary went to the tomb was probably between 3 and 6 a.m. She'd been unable to come to the tomb on the Sabbath, the Saturday, so she had decided to come very early, as soon as she could. Other women came to the tomb with Mary. Luke's gospel in chapter 24 verse 10 says, Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, came with Mary. But John's gospel, if you bring John back up, Ben, it says, John only records Mary Magdalene. 
she was the first. She was the first to discover the empty tomb. As we look at the story today, there are some firsts that are significant. And Mary Magdalene was the first, according to John, who went to the tomb early on that day and realized that the stone had been removed. Barclay, the commentator, says that Mary had sinned much and she loved much and love was all she had to bring. Just imagine, as we've talked about all that people are going through at the minute, here was Mary. Mary had stood at the foot of the cross a few days before. She'd witnessed her friend who had set her free, into, given her a new life. This Jesus, a few years before, Luke's gospel account, recounts that she had seven demons driven out of her. She had been set free into a life of total freedom. And all she had to give was her love and adoration to this Jesus. Now, she was one of many women who followed Jesus. But she, as John recalls, is the first to see the empty tomb. You know what? Jesus did not treat women as others in his culture did. And he treated them with dignity, as people of worth. Whilst all the other disciples had escaped on Good Friday in fear, Mary, with a few of the women, and John, stood at that cross. She had nothing else to give except just her life, her heart. She was devoted to this man. And so can you imagine on that Sunday morning, she wanted to be there as early as she could. It was still dark. Now, I was woken up this morning, very, not early, not very early, just early, by my dad. He'd phoned me up, he'd got into all sorts of a mess. But it was light. The Bible says it was still dark. Here is a woman who was so devoted. And something of this story that we, we kind of miss, that she was totally devoted to this man. She wanted to be there at that tomb to present the body with the spices, to prepare the body, to, to show it that love and the respect it deserved. And she wanted to be there as soon as she could. What must she have been thinking? What was really going through her mind? You see, we think of Resurrection Sunday as a day of celebration, a day of joy. But actually, the reality is, as we read this account from John 20, there's, there's much more going on. What was Mary really thinking as she came to the tomb? Her friend had gone. But where was he? The tomb was empty. Where was the body? She couldn't face this on her own. And it's really interesting. So she was the first to find the empty tomb, but what did she do? And as I've read this story again, it's almost, you almost think of the story, you know the story, but as you reread it, you suddenly think, you know what, I've never realized that. So she went to the tomb with the women, and then what does it say? From verse 2 to 9, uh, Ben, that's what we're going to have a look at. Verse 2 to 9. So what did she do? So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Verse 3. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there. 
as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. As we follow this account through John chapter 20, it's interesting what Mary did on discovering the empty tomb. What did she do? She went straight back. In fact, it says she went running to Peter. <clears throat> you know, what's one of the interesting things here is that Peter clearly is still the focal point of the group. Just cast your mind back a few days. What had Peter done in the courtyard? He had denied Jesus in almost a cowardly act. This Peter had denied Jesus three times. And yet, the Bible suggests through John's gospel that Peter was back amongst the group. You know what? It must have taken some guts for Peter to have gone back to that group. Wouldn't some of us have just escaped and hidden and tried to hide from the fact that we had totally messed up in our lives and we don't want anyone to know about it. But this Peter, in spite of denying Jesus, where do we find him? We find him back with the group. And not only that, that he could face these men, knowing, and, and women too, this whole group that had followed Jesus. I'm sure the whispers and the gossip would have gone round. They would have known what Peter had done. But he sat and stood with them over those few days, and he was able to look them in the eye. It was this Peter that Mary went to. You know, he had a strength of character that shows he was different to the others, I think. He was a natural leader. And as we've talked about spiritual gifts, if you want to know what it means to be a pastor, to be a leader, then we have to look at Peter. He was flawed. He had weaknesses. But he was a natural leader amongst this group. And he is the one with John that Mary went back to. I'm going to say something now that you might find a little bit difficult to, to take. But I see a lot of Peter in Mandy. She's your leader. And she's not perfect. But she's got something that Peter, Mary, and these other characters have. She has got a heart for Jesus. And yeah, we can be gifted, we can be skilled, but ultimately, what Jesus looks for in his followers is a heart for him. And Mandy... I know that you've got a heart for Jesus. And I know that you stand amongst men and you must think yourselves a bit like Mary. Am I good enough? I'm so flawed. They know everything that's wrong in my life, in my family. But Jesus has set you free. And he has put you in a position, I know, that, can, that only comes from the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And church, you've got an amazing person here that if you're willing to follow, willing to accept, willing to listen to, willing to accept all the flaws and the failings, she is incredibly gifted. She stood there on uh, Good Friday, and I know you've got an evangelistic heart. You're a preacher. You're, you'll stand on any corner and tell the world about Jesus because he has changed your life. And that's just what happened to Mary and to Peter. They were changed people. They'd been set free. They wanted to follow this Jesus wherever he went, in spite of their weaknesses. Mandy, you're just like that. I see that in you. I see Peter in you. And it was to Peter that Mary went. 
And then John describes this amazing race to the tomb. And I think in going back to my, my first question, one of my first questions about what moment in history would you like to have been part of? I'd have loved to have been in that garden on that resurrection Sunday. To see in all the quietness of the early morning, Mary and the women come into the tomb. Just running back to the disciples. And then there's this incredible race between Peter and John. Peter sets off first. And isn't that amazing that he hears the news that the tomb is empty and it's Peter that wants to get up and get out there straight away. But John, being probably much younger, catches up with him and goes past him. And then you've got this account, actually, that as John gets to the tomb first, what happens? He stops. It's almost as if he bows. To, I don't know why he does it. Maybe it's because he bows to the authority of Peter. Maybe it's that. Maybe he just doesn't want to go in because he's not that, that bold. But there is one man that will definitely go in. He catches up with John again. And what happens? He is straight in that tomb. John had only looked in. But Peter catches him up again. And he is straight in that tomb. He wants to see what's in there. And it's really interesting, actually. John doesn't hint at this, but Luke does. That Peter's reaction is one of confusion and being totally puzzled by what he sees. He can't find the body. He sees the linen cloths, but he doesn't understand what's going on. And Luke says, actually, that Peter goes home. But John, in this account, in his account of what happens, it says that he looks at the linen cloths. And sees that actually something's going on here. It, the body can't have been stolen. Because why? Because the, the cloths and the grave clothes, they were all folded up. It says in that account they were folded. What was going on? It was as if, and I can't describe it, but, but it's as if the body had just evaporated. And the cloths had just fallen exactly where they should have been. So the body hadn't been stolen. John was trying to work out in his mind what's going on here. And it says in his account that he, he looked and what? He believed. John was the first to believe in the resurrection. So Mary was the first to see the empty tomb. And John was the first to believe in the resurrection. These firsts are important. When the Bible describes who was first and the first of something, it's important that we take note and we try and think, what is going on here? If Mary was the first to see the empty tomb, if John was the first to believe, who was the first to see the risen Christ. John records this really, I, I just couldn't find a word to describe what this, this dialogue, this conversation, it's so intimate. But John records it between verses 11 and 18. Perhaps if we can bring that up, Ben. John 20, verse 11 and 18. And one thing to note here is, remember, so Mary had gone from the tomb to tell the disciples. Peter and John had gone back to the tomb. <clears throat> and now we find where? Mary's where? She's at the tomb. So she must have gone back. Because it says in verse 11, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. 
he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he, what he had said, these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. What must Mary really have been going through? I just don't know. Finds the empty tomb, goes back to the disciples, goes back to the tomb. She is crying her eyes out. And I don't know whether you've ever done that, where you've cried so much that you can't actually see and recognize someone because of the tears. You know, we can try and find reasons why she, Mary didn't recognize Jesus. I just think it's simple. She was crying her eyes out because she was so emotional. She was still mourning the loss of her friend who had now disappeared. She was crying and she just could not see through those tears. And we see from this account from John that she clearly wasn't thinking straight. She thought there was this gardener. And, and so what does she say? Because of a heart of love, she says, look, look, if you've, if you've taken this body somewhere, tell me where he is and I'll go and get him. Can you imagine in the state that she was in that would Mary really have been able to carry the body of Jesus? Where was she going to take him? What was she thinking? She was just in a total emotional state. And then comes this one word, Mary. She'd been looking in the tomb. She'd seen the cross a few days earlier. But with one word, she knew and recognized her master, his voice. And there is something in that. Something significant, I think, for every one of us. I believe really passionately that for every human heart, there comes a time when Jesus calls our name. And he calls it in a way that we know it's him. Years ago, I just know there was a time in my life when I could just sense this calling. I didn't know who it was. I'd been to church, but I knew from the story of Samuel as I read it that there was this voice calling. And I read that story and realized, actually, it was God calling. And just as Samuel, just as Mary, what is our response? Mary stood there and instantly knew what an amazing scene this must have been. And she turned. So it says she turned. So she was probably facing the tomb, still crying her eyes out, having this conversation with this gardener. And it says, with the word Mary, she turned. And what does she say? Teacher, master. She knew it was him. And you know what? There's something significant. There's got to be something significant that the Bible records that to who was the first person that saw the resurrected Christ? It was Mary. 
you know, I'm going to ask you another question. What would have happened if Jesus had appeared to Peter first? Do you think history would have changed? What if Jesus had appeared to Thomas first, the doubter? Would it have been different? But there is something significant that if we just read it and gloss over it, again, it was to a woman that was first. John makes it very clear it was to Mary that Jesus appeared first. And again, it comes back to those songs. It comes back to these characters, John, Peter, Mary. They weren't perfect people, but they had been set free. They were in love with Jesus passionately. And like any good historical event, there's always a conspiracy theory. Let me just state something very clear. Some might think that Jesus had a sexual relation with Mary. That somehow there was something sexual going on with John. The Bible says that they loved him. He loved them. Let's be clear. Let's not get fall into the trap of the world. There's something about that word love that we don't comprehend. Mary loved Jesus because she had been set free. John loved Jesus for many reasons. He had seen something in Jesus that he wanted to follow for years. And these characters here on this resurrection day are significant. And the fact that Jesus appeared to Mary first is significant, a woman. One word, Mary. You know, I think for every one of us, there perhaps has been a time or there may come a time when God will call your name, how are you going to respond? Jesus gave her a... It's quite surreal, isn't it? You know, we almost think that this resurrection day is about, you know, the guitars were out. The, the worship band was out. They were having a great celebration. Jesus is alive. But the reality is there's this strange bit about... In this account where Jesus, after that Mary word, and she knows who it is, says, you know, don't touch me. Don't hold on to me. You've got to let me go. And he gives her a simple instruction. Go and tell the disciples. And in her simple faith, she does exactly that. She goes back to tell them. And she declares, I have seen the risen Lord. You know, many of us and the world might say she was emotional. She saw something. She saw a ghost. What did she really see? Perhaps she was just, you know, making this up. But her declaration was clear to those disciples. I have seen the Lord. And more importantly, she had heard his voice. She knew it was him. As I've read this account... One thing that really struck me was that very early in the morning when it started, it started with an open door. And as we've read there, at the end of the day, it finished with a closed door. Again, we think that perhaps Resurrection Sunday was somehow a joyous day, a day of celebration. But the reality is, and we can learn so much from this, that the disciples shut the door. Why? Because they were in fear. Fear of the Jews coming to find them. They were in fear of what might happen to them. Maybe they feared the fact that maybe they as well would be crucified. So they locked the door. And I find it amazing that it starts with that empty tomb and the, the stone rolled away. And it finishes on that day with a closed door shut. Fear had taken over. But a closed door wasn't enough. Because we read that Jesus appeared. And I want to finish with the first words that Jesus gives to the whole group. 
He appears to the disciples, and what does he say to them? He says, peace. This isn't just a greeting, a traditional greeting. This isn't just a, a blessing. I think there's something in this for this world today. When man's heart is set on war, Jesus wants to speak peace into our lives. In all that we're going through, in all that people are going through today in this church and people we know, you know, one word that Jesus wants to speak to all of us today is peace. Peace. And I want you to leave here today, just walking out those doors. We could go out with a great song on our heart and just, you know, feeling good. He has risen, yeah. But actually, I want to speak a word into your life today in all that you're going through. It's a word, peace. Peace be to you. And in fact, Barclay interprets that. A blessing, that greeting. May God give you every good thing. I want us to go out of this place today with that blessing in our hearts, that word on our mind that in all this world of chaos and war right now, his word to us today is peace. You know, a little bit further on in John 20, verse 29. Jesus says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. Jesus is looking for a people that love him. Not perfect people. People with weaknesses. But he is looking for a people like you with a heart. With a heart for him who love him and will follow him. For some of you today, he's going to call you by name. You're almost going to hear your name and you're going to know it's him calling you. And for all of us, and I believe it's for all of us today, he wants to speak peace. Peace. In a world of chaos, in a world of confusion and puzzlement and what is going on, in a world of tears and a world of fear, Jesus today wants to speak to you that word, peace. And my prayer is that across this room today, the peace of God will fill our hearts and every good thing will fill our hearts and fill our lives, fill our families, and that we will go from this place, different people, a different church with peace in our mind, peace in our hearts, peace in our lives. That's my prayer for you today on this Resurrection Sunday. Amen.